da 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 you know, it's, it just it used to drive me mad. <laughs> I seemed to impress. I thought, I can't go through that. All that, you know, they're trying to put these two hands together. It sounds so difficult. You know, I knew my dad was good at it, but I thought, I don't think I can do that. Mm. So so I didn't go for piano. Violin's a long way from piano, though. What, what would make you want to even play that? God knows. <laughs> <laughs> I've regretted it ever since. Hey, everybody, this is your host, Vinyl Manjo of Unlikely Places Pop and Rock Radio. Today's guest is someone extremely special. I have two guests, actually. I have a guest co host, Kurt Vance of Power Pop Overdose, and from King Crimson, David Cross. He was the violin player. And, well, let's just let David Cross tell us all about his time in King Crimson and also just working on his new album as well. Thank you, Billy from Glass Onion, for setting this one up. Remember, guys, tune in, listen closely, and learn something new. Hi, this is Terry Draper from Clap 2. Hey, this is Paul Chastain. I'm Brendan O'Hare. I used to be in Teenage Fan Club. Vic from Star Collector. Bo and Rat, Jim Terrell. Josh Bradley. Paul Collins of The Nerves, The Breakaways, and The Beat. I'm Frankie Siragusa, and you're tuning in to Unlikely Places Pop and Rock Radio Show with Vinyl Man Jeb. Let's just have a chat down here. You're listening to Mad Wasp Radio. Morning. What got you into music, David? Uh, I think my dad, really. My, my father was a, a semi-pro musician. You know, when I say semi-pro, I mean, he was he was playing, you know, every, every moment, really, that he wasn't doing his day job. He was, you know, he'd come home from uh, from work and he had tended to, he had sort of clerical jobs mostly and he'd come home and uh, get changed into, uh, you call it a tuxedo, wouldn't you, into evening dress, we, used to, we call it. Uh, into his tuxedo and he'd go out and he'd play in the dance band in the evening. He was a piano player. And uh, then at the weekend, you know, he'd been organist, so he'd play in the church, uh, playing the organ. Uh, he played Saturday morning cinema, where you where you used to have sing-songs for the kids. So there'd be you know, all these cartoons for the kids and then there'd be a break and then they'd sing songs and, and he'd play the organ for that. He just was a musician all the time. So I grew up with that. He was kind of, I guess, a kind of model for me. And, and so I was always, I always thought it was magic. I was always sort of very excited by by music. And we always had piano. We always had two pianos for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know why. Yeah, because yeah, cause we had my, my grandparents came to live with us. That's right. They, their, their business fell apart. Um, they were running a fish and chip shop, which is where I was born. And their um, their fish and chip shop closed down because it was it was at the end of a ferry from Plymouth where the, all the servicemen used to go to an air force station and um, and they, they they sort of ran that down after the war and the huh. ferry got closed down um, it didn't come across the water anymore and so the the fish and chip shop which was called the Prince of Wales Cafe, which is where I was born, was closed down. So by that time, we'd moved somewhere else and they came to stay with us. So that's why we always had two pianos. Um, very, very strange. I was always fascinated <laughs> by, by by music. Um, so I, I guess it, I was destined to be involved with it from, from an early stage. But my, you know, I had an elder brother and, uh, you know, he didn't go into music. He, he, he played piano, oh. but... Um, but he, you know, didn't take it any further. And uh, I think he put me off playing piano. He used to, you know, he got as far as being able to play bits of furry lees. And, you know, and it was always da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. <laughs> da-da-da-da-da. Stop and think. Da-da-da-da. <laughs> Stop and think. Come on, John. Go on, you can do it. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, it's... It just it used to drive me mad. <laughs> I seemed to impress. I thought I can't go through that. All that you know, they're trying to put these two hands together. It sounds so difficult. You know, I knew my dad was good at it, but I thought I don't think I can do that. Mm. So, so I didn't go for piano. Violin's a long way from piano, though. What, what would make you want to even play that? God knows. <laughs> <laughs> I've regretted it ever since. I don't know. I was stupid. It's such a difficult instrument. I suppose it didn't look so difficult, did it? You know, <laughs> it looked simpler. You could carry it around with you. You know, it didn't have all those. It's an upside down computers. upright bass, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, not like all those black and white things in front of you and that sort of hand coordination i yeah i just didn't realize i just didn't realize how hard it was it's just the opportunity I, I think when i was sort of i don't know about eight or nine maybe nine it's quite late starting for for violin player 
and I um you know had the opportunity at school and it was either playing a recorder uh or a violin and I kind of like the look of the violin a bit I think and the we sound both. right because the only people that make yeah. the recorder sound good is a dude from the association <laughs> That's right. Yeah. It's 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 really it really does sound crap. The association they got away with. It. So we, I mean, we found we found one. We went out on a, a sort of day trip, but we weren't looking. We were just out on a, a trip to a, a town near uh, Plymouth, which is where I grew up, which is a, you know southwest of England. And um, it was a, a what we used to call a junk shop, which I, I don't know what you call it now. Pawn mm. shop, yeah, pawn shop type thing, or is it like a... something like that? It yeah. was it was just well, I remember we got it for a, for a pound, which was like two and a half dollars in those days, and it was um, you know we, we'd gone there on the train because we didn't have a car, and we came back on the train, and you know my father was kind of trying to make it make a noise, you know, and it wouldn't do anything, and. It took him till we got back home to to realize that there wasn't a bridge on it, you know. So mm-hmm. all the strings were just oh, flapping around. No. Going to make... So oh. then we had to, he found a friend of his in the dance band who you know rigged it out for me, and so it was a tiny one. It was a quarter sized violin actually. So that anyway, that's how I started. Yes, as I say, I did live to regret it. I, I didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I regret it. Right? I realized how hard it was. It was. It was... <laughs> but you're like in the top three as far, as far as violin players go, right? You got uh, you, you got uh, Jean Luc yeah. Ponty, yep. uh, yeah. uh, and Eddie Jobson, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. those those are the three names that you think of when you when you think of the violin. Yeah, but and... they can play. They're good players. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it from David Cross. They know, they, they know, they know what they're doing. You know, uh, I just I just stick it you know stick it through a fuzz battle battle and turn up as loud as possible you know and hope for the best uh, i you know I i've been it. playing catch up all my all my life i've been playing oh, no. catch up i i've worked i've actually worked through kind of you know two books of studies in the last couple of years and you know in an attempt to try and try and to raise understand my this instrument i've been playing for so long i need to yes, learn <laughs> i do i do That's i mean the good funny. news is I, i'm getting a bit better now you know it's kind of uh, I can. I'm up to the level that sort of the real. The great violinists were probably at when they were eight. You know. Mm-hmm. Ah, uh, yeah. But the great violinists that start when they're eight, whatever. You know, they don't get to play with Robert Fripp either. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. Or, no, they don't. Or, or, or heavyweights yeah. like uh, uh, Wenton or even Bill Bruford, who's one of my favorite drummers. Right. <laughs> right. So who gets to do that? Right. You could have been in the right place at the right time. That's, <laughs> that's, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's just luck. That's just luck. And knowing people and everything too i've learned that too as a musician myself i play guitar That's and it's funny. like it's yeah. such a it's yeah. not it's not about you know it's it's just knowing and it's so cool and i wanted to ask you a question yeah. about your your new album um which i was so excited to to get from uh billy from glass onion thank you for hooking up this interview okay. really cool and uh, i've been listening to it in the background and uh and also in the foreground of course i had to make a reference there to the painting <laughs> of that this makes but what was the inspirations behind getting to doing your solo album october is marigold and uh both the album and the song itself well it's it's a second album so the, the, the i mean the inspiration really was um for me was meeting andrew um and you know i met him when i was uh, well i had my own band the david cross band we were going to go to uh in, in, the, in the early 2000s sometime we were going to go to go and play in, t- in japan I was just trying to put together a kind of interesting set because I hadn't, I hadn't played in Japan before. And I wanted to do um, Trio from Starless and Bible Black, which is, mm-hmm. a, you know, a, a track where Bill, uh, well, famously within the King Crimson Clan, you know, didn't play. He just, um, you know, folded his arms and listened. And <laughs> and it was, it was just, uh, you know, John, Robert and me improvising together. But it's a very sweet little track. Anyway, I found I was I was trying I was looking I wanted to get it written down, but it, it was quite quite a hard job really. And 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 so I asked Robert if he knew if anybody had written it out, you know, because it would save time than having to transcribe it. And he told me about Andrew Keeling, who'd done a, ver- a version of it for Medieval Instruments, Ooh. which I didn't know about. Really, really interesting stuff. And I listened to that, and uh, and I was fascinated by it. And I just 
I just wanted to, to meet him. I, I actually then I started, at that time I was working um, at a university as well, so I, I decided to write something about this track as well. And um, so I met up with him anyway, and we got on really well. And decided to have a go at trying trying to play something together. And he's a lovely flute player, and so we did the uh, first album, which was called English Sun, and that's a uh, a really kind of summary. Um, summary piece it was the way we were when we we kind of got together um you know it was a magical experience i mean the lovely thing about um king crimson that was great um was that we did improvise together and we loved doing it um and we we understood each other we knew you know we knew kind of the parameters of where we could go and and we gradually learned how far we could push each other with it you know mm -hmm. and you know when the other person would fall apart which is mostly me falling apart but um <laughs> you know we, we we kind of listen really closely and and I, I kind of thought everybody did that um and then after crimson you know when i tried to find other people to to do this with it i found it was it wasn't so easy to find such people um you know and to digress for a bit, I mean, one of the things was most people who like improvising go into jazz, mm. and mm. I, I hadn't, I had, you know, I had done a bit of that, but I, I, I wasn't kind of immersed in jazz, and I wasn't able to play it in the way that um, jazz players do, and we hadn't really done that. They kind of referenced jazz, I guess, in, in Crimson, but we, we, it wasn't. We weren't playing jazz. We weren't playing. Um, we weren't playing swing. We weren't playing over those kind of changes, and and stuff. And I found it very hard to find other people, um, you know, who had a similar kind of background, who were able to kind of improvise freely, um, you know, away from that language. I mean, so much so that I did spend quite a long time trying to learn to play jazz. After that, um, you know, I, again, mm. I think I probably wasted fifteen years doing that before I gave up on that as a bad job. But, <laughs> but rocks one thing, try. jazz is another. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember John Etheridge, uh, so, so she guitar. So I met with him, and he said, "Oh, it's just another language." He said, "You know, just like, like um, you know, like pop or rock or anything, mm. you know." I sort of looked at his massive hands, you know, flashing around his guitar. And thought, well, you know, and this may, this, you know, this may be just another language for you, Joe, but it's going to take me a while to get get hold of this. But anyway, what the, the the kind of miracle for me of uh, meeting up with Andrew again was that he 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 really understood um, what I was doing, and I and I could read him as well. And it's something to do with a kind of shared background to some extent. You know, although I wasn't a classical violinist, I'd had a kind of education to be a music teacher. And so um, I knew, uh, you know, I'd listened to a lot of classical music and listened to a lot of modern music as well and world music. And and so I had sort of, you know, the same similar kind of insights to him. Well, well you know, that album, October's Merry Go, being mostly improvised, you and Keeling play off of each other so well together. Yes, I know. It's, it's lovely. You, you know, there's this thing in, that musicians always talk about, which is kind of the music be coming through you rather than you generating it. When you are improvising well or playing well, actually, it, it's not. It's as if something else or somebody else is playing the music and you're just trying to not get in the way, you know? Mm. <laughs> and, like um, host. <laughs> yes, that's right. And and it's, you know it's very very a very common experience for people to, to talk about music that way. With Andrew, it was just like that all the time, you know. And, and but it was you know very very rich because it, you could, I could feel the music developing as well hmm. in a way that that is that I think was beyond both of us. But it was certainly beyond, beyond me. I would never have been able to compose in such an exciting way as I was able to play with him, and he was able to play with me. If you didn't know it, you would think everything was written down, right? It's just that perfect. It's you know, I've listened to it a couple of times and, and I really, really like it. Uh and it's not that weird free experimental stuff like Ornette Coleman or anything like that. It's just melodic and yes. rhythmic. Yeah, and it feels good to listen to. It doesn't make me all edgy. I mean, I've always found myself in a bit of an uncomfortable place. And you know, if if you're not doing jazz and you're doing a kind of with this kind of European jazz, which is it involves a which is called free and free improvisation seems often to come to mean you don't make it sound nice that you try and make it sound as dissonant and as um, mm, yeah. arrhythmic and atonal as possible I, I don't think that's freedom i think freedom is mm. 
um, the ability to choose whether you want it to sound consonant and pleasant and harmonic or to right. choose not to. And, and it's musical, and that's what I really appreciate. But John Coltrane, his last yeah. couple albums went down that path of free jazz or improvisational jazz. It didn't feel good. And, and this one, I actually feel good. I love listening to it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm very excited by it because, I, as, I, as I say, you know, I couldn't have written it. <laughs> I, I couldn't have thought of it. And, and that's, that's what's so rich to me. I, 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 I mean, I've learned, you know, an amazing amount from Andrew. I mean, he's a, you know, he's, he's a real composer, you know, he's a real kind of mm. a, a contemporary comp composer. He's written, you know, lots of serious inverted commas, bits of music or com compositions. He has this wonderful ability to leave things out to make a kind of minimal framework, you know, and the, one of the things that makes, um, you know, October, well, the, the track October is Marigold particularly, I think, is it, is, is where the, the rest of it surrounded at this track. That was the first thing we did for this and the rest of it kind of surrounds it because it's, you know, a repeated kind of organ sequence and it's really very, very simple. And it just cycles over and over again. You know, it's a very, very kind of old form. But it just inspires you to do wonderful things over it, you know? It just right. it just made me want to play with a sound. Felt I wanted to be a trumpeter. Mm. And, I, and I, you know, and I sort of grab one of my sounds that's where I've interfered with a, you know, the, the attack. So it's a bit like a trumpet. And I just, you know, I just loved it. I, I was suddenly exploring in a way I'd never done before. And it was just a simple frame, you know? Right. He, that's what he does so beautifully. And it, it changes up. sound, though, and it changes the way it's played, which is so cool to take, like, a simple frame like that and be able to move it into something more than what the instrument you ever thought was possible. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I, I just love, uh, you know, I love the stuff I've done with him. And, and, we, haven't, and we haven't done much, and, and, and in a way... You know that makes it even more <laughs> meaningful, yeah. even more yeah. important. Absolutely. Well, quick you know, question though: yeah. you guys recorded that in two thousand nine. How come it sat in the yeah. can so long? Oh God, I don't know. I'm just lazy. I have an overactive um, critic, you know, stands behind me, not very far away, and you know, whenever I'm enjoying doing something and it sounds absolutely great to me, I turn around and he punches me in the nose yep. and says, oh, it's horrible, isn't it? I have that in real yeah, life. Well, it's not even just my music. It's like everywhere <laughs> I go and I try to like go to the store or something and the overactive credits, like you can't buy that today. Oh. I, I totally get it. It's that it's that self high bar that you set because we're so yeah. passionate and it's like, ah! Well, you know, yeah, I, just, I, I go around in cycles on stuff. I record something, and you know, and I have this critic come in. And I say, "Oh no, I can't put that on." Oh, no, no, no. You <laughs> well, know, and, and, and it goes into a folder somewhere, and I work on something else. You know, and yeah. then you know, five years, five years later, I open it by accident. You know, trying to find well, something. Well, this sounds good. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Why well, didn't I put that out? You know. Yeah. Well, I for one am glad that it did see the light of day. Me too. Uh, it's a lot of fun to listen to. Thank you. Thank you very much. My favorite track is Kingfisher. I really enjoy that one. And I really enjoy uh, just the, the two Marigold parts as well. And I was like, this is really cool because it's something different. You know, you see David Cross's name, you know, and you're thinking, oh, this is going to have. And you're like, no, this is actually really cool. It's something very different, but also down a similar vein. So you're comfortable listening to it. And it's one of those albums you drop the needle on and it, you just drop it and you listen to it. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about anything. Right. It all flows really well into oh, yeah. each other. And I really. I I've kind of haven't, st haven't listened to it lately. Once it's out there again, I kind of stop listening to, I understand that to too, things. Yeah. But, I, but Kingfisher, I think it was a key track because of the because of, because of the connection to nature. I think mm -hmm. that's one of the themes that kind of runs runs through everything we've done. Actually, I mean. All right, we're going to spin Kingfisher there real quick for you. Give a chance to hear what David Cross has been up to as well, not just hear us talking about it.
um, I, I grew up very much, um, you know, outside. I, you know, we, we, uh, you know, where I where I lived, we had we were on the we were at the sea, the sea's a place called Plymouth. It's on the seaside. Well, we should know about Plymouth, um, <laughs> but it's uh, it, it's on the coast, and there's the sea there. And then the, I was on the edge of Dartmoor, so which has this kind of rugged, uh, open terrain there where I used to go hiking, camping, you know, day, night, fog, snow, all the time I was out there. So I, you know, I have a kind of understanding of the outdoors and, and Andrews is very much an outdoors person mm -hmm. as well. He He's always, you know, going up and down mountains and things like that. And um, I think we, we have that kind of shared understanding just how awesome, you know, nature is and how you know how exciting it is how small you feel and how much sometimes you can just feel part of the landscape you know and that we're only really here for a short time really and all this stuff is going to keep going you know the kingfishers are still going to be there 100 years from now you know um, i'm certainly not but the kingfishers will still be around i hope <laughs> <laughs> and, and your music will still be around too right so <laughs> we'll I see hope so too. Well, I, I, won't. Won't. <laughs> I won't you may <laughs> that's so true that you know music is very uh, timeless too which is incredible i've always i've always felt like when i make music even i feel like it's a kind of time travel it's, it is an exciting mm -hmm. aspect to it to me that's one of the things that came out from andrew i think he brings that because the simplicity of the kind of arrangement ideas the kind of structuring ideas he comes up with they're off they often sound you know like they're from from you know medieval times or um, you know or, or sometime in the past, it's in everybody's sort of background vocabulary. And so, if you lock into that, you are in a timeless place. You know, mm -hmm. and I think you know I I often feel we don't you know sometimes we're moving forward, sometimes we're going backwards. It's like you know time travel is. Yeah, and I feel possible. like that when I listen to King Crimson records in general and, and stuff yes. like Zappa too, where if I put the needle down and figuratively and literally, because I do have a lot of records in my collection and uh, yeah. definitely with Prague, even Emerson, Lincoln Palmer too, I seem to pick up certain essences that you hear it, like even though you're listening to the same songs, you hear a different rhythm every time. Like your brain can't pick up everything at once. So it's always really enjoyable to hear a new rhythm and it's like, this is old. Why am I just hearing this now? And it's so cool because there is, yeah. especially with prog rock, there is a timeless aspect to that. And it's like a puzzle when you flip it over. It's still the same puzzle, but it's like a 3D effect to it. And I really like that. And it shows you how much you as the listener mm -hmm. are adding to it or, yeah. or controlling the experience. You know, what we we tend to forget that. We, you know, the... the you know, the artist is only, or the, you know, the composer, the musician, mm -hmm. is only, only works because of the contribution of the listener. You know, yeah. you, the listener yeah. needs to be there making, you know, working at it, making sense of what's coming to them. You could do or as much as you want on your own. You really can. You could do as much as your body can do, yeah. your mind can do, but it is that other person that comes in and says, hey, I really enjoy that. Yeah. And I know working with others has been probably a gift for you as well. And I saw that even though you've parted ways with Crimson in the past and weren't on a lot of the later records, you also still worked with members, correct, on your own solo stuff with them too. Yeah, I have. I've been lucky to work with, uh, well, I worked work with, with Mel Collins. And, ah, cool. Uh, you know, Robert, Robert played on uh, an album I did and John did. Oh, wow. Did something with Bill. I don't think it ever saw the light of day. We were, well, we got to see that. We, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, we'll be begging you now. <laughs> yeah, he, he I, is I, I think I, I think I was more into it than he was. I think he, <laughs> I think he vetoed that one. That was that was I know at the time it was uh, he was very much this was after after I was in Crimson he was very much um, you know into his jazz thing mm. and uh, that's right and it was with a bass player and it was kind of going down a jazz line and I was kind of going down I was going down more of a Beyond Cold Train um, <laughs> <laughs> thing at the time. And um, and we didn't quite didn't quite find any meeting ground really there, but it was it was it was it was a nice thing. I did, uh, you know, I would like to have done something more with Bill, you know, but he's he's retired himself now, yeah. hasn't he? But yeah, I you know, and I'm working with uh, don't, I've been playing with Stickman, and ah. so got, uh, and you're still good friends with Robert Fripp. I know you did a couple albums on his yeah. label in the seventies. Yeah, we I've uh, we we kind of we communicate by email rather than face to face. I mean, I hmm, whenever yeah. I've been to That's see the rooms at the concerts, I never get him to get to see him. Oh, you know, geez. whether I'm backstage or front stage. So. <laughs> 
I don't know what. To, but yes, no, we're all we're, we're you know we're we're very we're still talking good, about stuff all the hear. time. Uh, you know, there's uh, an album we did together called um, uh, Starlight, Starless Starlight, Ooh. and I was going to bring that out on put that out on vinyl. So I was talking to him about that this year, and he's happy with that as well. So. What was it like working with those heavyweights like Fripp and and Wetton and Bruford? Was what was it like? Yeah, was it uh, a pleasant experience? Or well, they, was but they it like... weren't heavyweights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they're, no. they're great musicians. Yes, right. Um, but you know they were uh, nice people. Yeah, <laughs> I got you. Just, yeah. Just, you know, and <laughs> you know, although you know, though I mean, they all had a you know great you know experience of success beyond. Um, you know, beyond anything I could come near. It didn't feel like kind of I was out of my depth or anything, but had, we had a lot of fun, you know. It, we had different ways of relating to each other. I mean, I would go sightseeing with, with Bill. Ah, oh, cool. Um, you know, get jo- drunk with John and, um, <laughs> you know, with Robert. We'd sort of, what did we do with Robert? We'd talk about magic and things like that. Ah, oh, cool. Um, you know, magic and... It, He'd talk about, you know, he was still, he was into kind of health food and stuff way before, you know, anybody very, else was. Very really. cool. Yeah, I, I've yeah, always, no, I like to hear when well, the bandmates have chemistry outside the music themselves and have things that they're doing yeah. other than just the performances, you know. You can a- actually hear it, right? Because uh, mm-hmm. pretty much everything you did with Crimson was live and you can hear it. I mean, just yeah. how well you guys play with each other. It's awesome. <laughs> No, but there were, I, I think there was a very clear, you know, understanding of what we were trying to do as well. We knew we had to work, even though they'd had success. We knew we had a task in front of us, mm-hmm. and we knew we had a job to do, and we knew we had to win friends. Um, we and you know the only way to do that was to be ourselves and be uh, ourselves and welcome them into our living room and try and put us into their living room. You know, it was. Uh, we're very aware of, of, of what we were trying to do with the audience, I think. Um, you know, and that you can't do that with if you know if you don't if you're not kind of yeah working you have as a to family. have that chemistry. Have wow, what a chat! That was David Cross of King Crimson. We're just gonna say bye to him here in this little end segment. Thank you guys for tuning in this week. Just a reminder that we do have merch for unlikely places over on RoboJackRecords.com. Just click that merch tab and you can click up at unlikely places hoodie, mug, shirt, anything that you desire you want. Unlikely Places has over on RoboJackRecords.com. Just click that merch button. Come support us out. The show is done just by fans of music, and we don't really make that much money, so we're always trying to throw some merch in to keep this show going. Thank you guys so much. So uh, really appreciate okay. it. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great weekend. You too. Thanks, David. Thanks. Bye. You're tuned into Mad Radio, so don't forget where you are. Don't change that dial.